welcome everybody. Thanks for joining in our uh, inaugural webinar uh, discussing introduction to occupation environmental medicine. Uh, it's a pleasure to have people join in and I can see people still joining in. Uh, we have uh, an increased interest uh, from overseas. Me and John Schneider are both based in Australia uh, and uh, uh, I'm based in Sydney. John's based in Mackay or Cairns at the moment. Mackay. Mackay. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to see people joining in from overseas, uh, from all over the world. Uh, thanks to all the participants who are joining in with us uh, from overseas, from the Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you and also all of our fellows, colleagues and registrars joining us from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, today is the 21st of April 2023. It's a pleasure and a delight to have Associate Professor John Schneider with me today to discuss about, uh, inter, uh, to do an introduction on occupational environmental medicine. Um, it's probably more than an introduction. Uh, and before we delve into that, I'll probably like to share more about John Schneider. I've had the luxury of being a student of John Schneider over 10, 15 years ago. Um, and, um, and to this day, uh, I've been involved and I continue to learn a lot from him. Um, uh, I'm a consultant uh, in Australia uh, and uh, me and John both are also fellows of the Australian faculty and also of the Irish faculty as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick introduction on John before we go into the slides. Uh, John Schneider is an associate professor at uh, Mackay Clinical School. He's been affiliated uh, with the James Cook University Faculty of Medicine, Health and Molecular Sciences. And he holds memberships of the Australasian College of Tropical Medicine and Safety Institute of Australia. As I've told you before, he's also a fellow of the Australasian Faculty of Occupation and Environmental Medicine and the Irish Faculty of Occupational Medicine. He's been an examination coordinator for the Middle East for several years uh, and is currently a member of their examination committee. He's also on the faculty assessment committees with the Australasian faculty. Uh, John graduated from the Queensland University and obtained a graduate diploma of occupational health and safety from Curtin University. Initially in his life, he practiced as a family physician and later as a consultant in occupational medicine in Northern Australia, mainly in the mining and agriculture sector and their associated services. Uh, up till 2013, he worked at the Institute of Public Health in UA University, where I met John for the first time, uh, lecturing in occupational medicine to both undergraduate and postgraduate medical students and vocational OHS practitioners and students. Uh, John has had an exciting career. Uh, he's uh, been involved with the Health Authority of Abu Dhabi and other oil and gas uh, industries in the local area. Uh, he's had the opportunity to go out into the Middle East and do various sessions, workshops and seminars face-to-face uh, -face in Iraq, um, in the local Middle Eastern communities and also in India. And he's at widely attended various international conferences and done several research papers. Uh, John returned to Australia in 2014 um, and resumed uh, his uh, medical education uh, to James Cook University as an associate professor until 2023, where he's recently transferred, transitioned into part-time practice. Uh, he's currently uh, actively working on a part-time basis and is quite keen on education and hence why the opportunity to have John on board with us today. Uh, his main areas of interest are occupational health in rural and remote work sites, workplace rehabilitation, ergonomics in particular, working in hot environments, where I've seen John publish actively a lot and consulted to various organizations overseas and postgraduate education in occupational medicine and health. Uh, so that's a very brief introduction of uh, a legacy I know personally. Um, so over to you, John. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone and, and uh, particularly to some of uh, my former acquaintances from the Middle East. Uh, I gather we have a few here today. Uh, now, uh, Hopefully uh, everything will work all right. I'm getting a, a little bit of a note now and again that I've got an unstable uh, uh, connection to the internet. 
uh, with luck, we'll get through it. Um, that's just our starting slide. So, Fahan, if you want to move on to the next one. Um, and, and the aim of this is to uh, just make sure people are aware of the sort of work factors associated and relevant to uh, work related uh, ill health and injury. Uh, next one. Yeah, uh, this this one was interesting. It was a, a graveyard. Oh, can we go back to that? Yeah, a, a graveyard I went to uh, in Scotland, actually, and I saw these uh, tombstones. Um, and it made me start to think that, that work is and has for many centuries um, been relevant to individuals. Uh, you can see three different headstones. No, no problem with language here. Um, and the only thing that's on them, um, from what I gather, is the occupation of the person that's buried below. Um, on on the left, there's uh, one probably a uh, a carpenter or a, or a mason. Um, the one in the middle is a uh, is a baker, and the one on the right, the very elaborate one on the right, uh, must have been from a very well well to do uh, farrier. Uh, someone handling horses. So they're all very old, probably before a lot of the people uh, buried there uh, had the opportunity to go to school and gain some literacy. So from that point of view, uh, you, uh, Tom the farrier or, or Bill the baker, um, and that was how they were known amongst, amongst their own conditions. So. So work has certainly been something very important in the lives of lots of people in the past and indeed in the present. If we can move on. Good. Uh, the objectives we're just running through. Uh, if we can move on to the next one. Uh, well, what, what's occupational health? Um, it's, and this is from the ILO and Workplace Health and Safety, uh, the World Health Organization, I mean, um, published in 1950, and it hasn't changed much since then. Uh, promotion and maintenance degree of physical, mental, and social well-being in workers in all occupations. Next one. Uh, and that includes the effects of a person's work on their health. And next one. And also uh, the effects of a person's health on their capacity to work. Next. So that fits in nicely with the core medicine, uh, the core uh, business of medicine, um, where we're managing or, or approached by the general public and our patients to help them manage perceived risks. Um, and that fits in nicely with. Uh, general risk management uh, and the steps in that that most of you hopefully will realise are identifying the hazard, assessing the risk, determining the controls and then assisting with implementing the controls, monitoring the effects of those controls and, and from time to time reviewing the overall process. Next one.
What we got is a hazard, which is a situation or a substance with the potential for causing injury, damage or loss of an asset. And risk is really a determination of the probability uh, of loss as a consequence to exposure to the risk. Um, and it's something that lots of people get mixed up about is, is they talk about risks when they're really talking about a hazard. Risk really um, involves determining the consequences and the pro probability that something nasty will happen. There are lots of hazards around the place, but of course, if people aren't exposed to them, there's no risk or adverse consequences. Uh, next one. Thanks, Fuzzy. Um, so, if there is exposure, what we need to do is determine the risk, and to some extent, that uh, depends on the dose. Um, which is a factor, if you like, of concentration or time, um, and then the consequences of that. Next. And, and that's, there's many ways of doing that, but a semi-quantitative one that I've found pretty useful um, not being a statistician, is, is looking at this risk assessment matrix. And there are several of these. Um, this one is nice and simple if you are um, involved ones that are available on the internet if you want to, but it's something to carry around or to refer to if you're doing some form of risk assessment. Next one. Um, talking a little bit about who's involved uh, in occupational uh, health, um, the hygienists come in and they're helpful for us um, when we want to quantify something, and, and which is also very useful if you want to get nice hard information on, on exposure and the nature of the exposure and the concentration. So they're involved in hazards, identifying and confirming the hazards and, and putting figures on the concentration, if you like, particularly physical, chemical and biological hazards that are around. And also they play a part in exposure monitoring, both uh, pre and post controls. In other words, helping recognise what the hazard is if it's, if it's a chemical or something that can be measured, confirming that in the environment, and then quantifying it, evaluating it, and monitoring it to make sure that it's been removed or uh, that there's some uh, process taking place that re reduces the risk. Next one. Um, if you like, occupational and industrial medicine looks a bit of that and applies that to the worker. And also to do that, you need to have some sort of awareness of the workplace. Um, the other thing is with the hazards that the worker is faced with, um, the occupational physician or occupational health worker is also needs to be aware of psychological factors and social factors, which often aren't considered uh, by the hygienist or chemist that's associated with things. And again, with exposure management, um, both pre and post control that we've talked a little bit about later, uh, recognising the hazards, confirming it's present, treating the exposed people, and treating the workplace uh, where we may be wanting to do something about uh, removing or reducing the exposure. Um, if possible, eliminating um, and then monitoring and preventing 
other people from doing. So uh, the traditional medical practitioner often just treats one patient. Uh, the occupational physician uh, usually needs to get involved with treating the workplace as well as the worker. There's no point in like uh, a patient I saw only a few weeks ago uh, with a carpal tunnel syndrome that was exposed to considerable hand arm vibration, went along to his GP, got a referral to the orthopedic surgeon who decompressed his carpal tunnel, sent him back to work. He came back later on with a recurrence of the symptoms. So what he did was uh, referred him on to another orthopaedic surgeon who injected cortisone into his uh, carpal tunnel, um, sent him back to work, and uh, everything was all right for a couple of weeks, and then he started getting the same symptoms again. So in a lot of situations, you really need to consider the workplace and make sure that the hazard has been eliminated or treated there. There's no point in, in treating symptoms without treating the cause of those symptoms, as hopefully everyone uh, attending this meeting is concerned about. And the management of the risk, uh, we use the hierarchy of control pyramid that's also on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, the best control, of course, is elimination to remove the hazard um, altogether from the from uh, getting rid of the exposure to the hazard to the worker. If not, we can substitute something else that's not as hazardous, if necessary. Engineering controls, perhaps, to isolate the worker from the hazard, and there's a lot going there. Uh, artificial intelligence and and uh, robotics in the workplace. Um, if not, we can look at administrative controls, uh, and that may mean rotating staff around to reduce exposure times or failing everything else, personal protective equipment. And hopefully, as everyone in this webinar is concerned, um, everyone here recognises that Personal protective equipment is the least important and the least effective of all those sort of controls because you've done nothing about the hazard. If the hazard is still there, um, then there's exposure, but you're relying on something else to limit that exposure or mitigate the exposure or, or relieve it. If there's a failure in that, of course, you're going to be exposed again. Next one. The objectives, we'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, if you could move to the next slide. Okay, bringing in public health. Um, and it's probably better to think of occupational medicine and public health together um, because if there's in a significant number of workplaces, there are more than one worker in the workplace. Um, and then, so there may be several people that are exposed to the hazards. And the one that we pick up of, uh, first, of course, is that, that who's either had the biggest exposure or is susceptible to adverse um, effects from that exposure. Uh, but we need to keep in the back of our mind all the time that what you need to identify is, are there more than one people being exposed? So we're looking at the working public in that situation. If we can move on to the next. The basic requirements for good health in a, in a population are access to clean water, good food, shelter, clothing and health. Uh, and that's where the um, public health and preventive medicine comes in. Next one. And that's the 
what we're looking initially is in occupational health, um, but uh, there are other factors that we look at if we look at the whole environment. Next. Okay, so you can see because there's so much involvement in hazards in the workplace and workers' health, um, there's a there's a necessity for often multidisciplinary teams to get involved with expertise from uh, particular areas. We've already talked about. Um, occupational hygienists, uh, but there are a lot of other people involved. Next. Uh, the employers, the organisation that the person is working for and intervention from that sector, other workers, unions, governments in making policy and hopefully policing policy the judicial system, particularly when there's some uh, problems that can't be dealt with uh, or some uh, concern about whether they've been dealt with adequately enough, uh, workers' compensation insurers and the general public. And we've got to remember that in a lot of workplaces, there's interaction with the public and the workplace may be providing services to those uh, people. And they, in that situation, uh, they have a, uh, an obligation to provide safe interaction or safe products. Next. Okay, so the involvement, as we said, it's multidisciplinary. Hopefully, uh, if you've got a good situation, you've got access uh, to trained occupational health nurses, hygienists we've already mentioned, clinical psychologists, toxicologists, ergonomists, looking again at the systems in place in the workplace, physiologists, health and safety managers, epidemiologists, health uh, physicists, microbiologists, safety engineers, sociologists and, and lawyers, of course, um, in, if there are problems arising to um, manage those hazards. Um, next one. Okay, so a brief history. Occupational medicine, if you like, goes back to Hippocrates uh, when he's considering the health of people. Um, and it was recognised centuries ago that occupational and environment, uh, the occupation and the environment is relative to health. Um, Agricola came around uh, in the 16th century and identified uh, that uh, in his publication on the mining and, and metalliferous industries that miners frequently were found to be short of breath and dying prematurely. And there's one case he described of a widow who had outlived seven husbands um, who were involved in gold and silver mining in the Czech Republic. Um, it was interesting uh, when in Queensland, and Australia at the moment dramas about exposure to silica dust in the mining environment and in other other situations where um, silica dust can be uh, uh, produced um, as if that was something new and something we didn't know anything about um, and here it is it's in the literature 500 years ago um, and frequently this happens. People get used to um, working in a in a unhealthy environment and exposing themselves to risk. And the more you're exposed yourself to the risk, the less you perceive it as being a risk, unless someone 
has some adverse constant, uh, consequences of exposure that they've come across. Um, and that's what we're exposing now. It's not a new disease. It's not a new problem. It's something that's been known about for centuries, but people haven't continued with their ongoing management of risk and prevention. Um, and then in the 1700s, Bernardino Ramazzini in Italy published the first textbook, if you like, of occupational medicine. And one of the quotes from that, uh, of course, is when a doctor visits a working class home, he should be content to sit on a three-legged stool if there isn't a gilded chair and should take time for his examination and question the, the patient. Um, the questions recommended by Hippocrates, but he should also add one more question, and that's what is your occupation? Um, as we said, that's a possible consequence of many hazards in the work, uh, many uh, health and injury uh, conditions that can occur in the workplace. Next one. Okay, so work is a cause of disease and injury. Moving on. This is some data. And, and I find using epidemiological data um, is something we need to be more and more aware of. And we need to make our actions and uh, explain our. Uh, our ideas and recommendations using epidemiological information. And this is getting a little bit old, but uh, it's reasonably good uh, information published by the World Health Organization. Um, 2.3 million people die from work-related accidents or disease in 2008. And that was that's over six thousand deaths a day. So it's a big problem worldwide. Um, what we need to be aware of, though, is the next bit: how many of those died as a result of work-related illness? Next one. And if you look at statistics and workers' compensation. Uh, data, particularly where I work, you'll find that the biggest reported health issues from work are usually associated with traumatic injury, um, burns, broken bones, cuts, other forms of trauma. Um, Whereas if you look at the overall health data, again, and as I said, this comes from uh, the uh, ILO, 86% um, of those deaths are due to illness, not injury. Um, injury is easy to determine and easy to be aware of, and usually someone's been around to see what's happening. Illness causing death from work-related conditions often happens over prolonged periods of time with gradual deterioration in health. Um, it's something because it comes on slowly uh, and the person may be moving from one occupation to another. Um, those situations, unless the medical practitioner is aware of it and ask the questions are often overlooked. Next one. So what's occupational medicine about? In particular, um, there's a clinical aspect that you get involved with. As we said earlier, prevention is important. There's no point in sort of if you like, uh, picking out the person with the problem and forgetting that there are often other people involved. Um, you need 
to get involved with environmental factors as well as the industry. You need to have some knowledge and awareness of medico legal issues, uh, often asked of to give your uh, opinion whether work could be a causative factor in a medical condition or an, or an injury, particularly one that results in disability. Uh, again, some background in public health and the other factor that's often forgotten is the military situation and the health in that area. And I know in um, many countries overseas, particularly not so much in Australia, but occupational physicians are often employed within the military and have an involvement there to make sure that those workers um, are fit and healthy and can uh, deliver the goods. Next one. So we need some sort of expertise and awareness in the diseases that are common to particular occupation. We need to be aware of disability resulting from injuries and illness in the workplace and the rehabilitation or management of that, hopefully getting the injured or ill worker back into a situation where he can resume proactivity in the workplace. You need to have some background in toxicology and particularly um, a bit of the chemistry of uh, hazardous chemicals that may be found in the, in particular workplaces you need to have an understanding of occupational hygiene um, and the data that comes out of hygienists and interpreting that appropriately, ergonomics, industrial safety issues and how health and safety is managed on work site. Epidemiology, as I said, is, is particularly good. Um, to give you some background and awareness of what what the common hazards are and what have you, uh, you need uh, law uh, background and some idea of legislation and regulations in that area, um, and then management, including planning, policy development absence management, workers' compensation and industrial relations issues. And they can all be sort of dragged into a management situation if you're dealing with uh, the management in, in a particular workplace and that working situation. Next one. Um, Medical treatment itself, as we're aware of, primary treatment is usually first aid um, and, and in hazardous situations, there's often first aid um, data around the place that it's available. Secondary treatment is usually more specific to what's going on and may involve admission to hospital or attendance with a medical practitioner. Um, or even surgical procedures or medical procedures. And, and the third issue or, or step in medical treatment is rehabilitation. In other words, helping to manage um, impairments which result in disability and uh, hopefully with a view of getting the injured or ill worker back into a productive work situation. Next one. Okay, so I realize that we've got a very diverse audience here, but hopefully in most uh, uh, countries and situations, there's some form of insurance, medical insurance, uh, covering people uh, who experience illness or injury in the workplace. Um, in Australia, uh, there's a statutory requirement for insurers, um, either with a government insurance um, company that provides um, 
that service or with some of the bigger employers, particularly uh, the multinational ones and the uh, those uh, practicing in various states and jurisdictions um, may be self-insured with their own insurers. Um, there's a government regulator in Australia anyway, and the aims there of that insurance is to cover the cost of health care, to provide income replacement services if the patient is unable to work because of a work-related illness in situations where there is a permanent impairment that can't be um, repaired, if you like, um, then frequently there's access to lump sum payments uh, through some form of uh, assessment. Now, uh, yeah. So there's advice, compensation on uh, various efforts, and you may be involved with talking to patients about that. Um, one of the things that I find difficult in Australia anyway is trying to get people to uh, understand the difference between impairment and disability. Um, and that's put forward in uh, in the World Health Organization. They've published it where impairment is loss of a function of a particular body part or bodily function and disability relates to how that loss of function affects the capabilities and the capacity of that injured individual. You can see on the left slide there, that's a person with a very obvious impairment. He's lost his leg and it was a patient of mine when I was looking after an amputee clinic at the local hospital. Um, and he got very frustrated after he lost his leg and couldn't wait to see a prosthetist. So he made his own prosthetic, which you can see underneath out of um, this guy was a, a, a boiler maker, so he was used to dealing with steel and he had a, a steel sort of uh, peg leg, if you like, with a hinge so he could uh, so he could bend his knee or the artificial knee and uh, the stump was encased in a, uh, in a lamb's wool sleeve. So very, very practical functional outcome. And you can see on the right something a bit more up to date and a bit more modern. Um, and that person again has a significant impairment with loss of a limb, uh, but his disability is situational and it varies from what he's doing. And in that situation, he's riding a bicycle quite competently and safely and has that capacity. Um, so, we've got to realise that the impairment may be looking at loss of function of parts of the body, but often that impairment, the disability arising that from that can be managed or overcome. Um, so impairment and disability are two different things that hopefully as for those of you that are medical practitioners, we can sort of make people aware uh, that that's the situation, that in, impairment is probably not the best um, measure of the effect of a person's injury or illness. Um, disability is more um, significant as far as the worker's capacity to do particular tasks. Next one. Yeah, what we're looking at is corporate occupational medicine, uh, something that's 
disappearing from the Australian situation. Um, I know when I started my occupational medical training, one of our big uh, multinational companies employed uh, 14 doctors full time. Um, it's now just released their last full time medical practitioner. And it's probably going to go the way of a lot of other multinationals where they contract out the medical services. So they're relying on someone that they hope has a close enough affinity with their workplace and can do that. Um, Bahan, we seem uh, to have... My, my apologies. I, I, I think I scrolled the mouse too much there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so where were we? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, next one. Yeah, there. No, back. Back. So, you know, there's... When I was overseas, back again. Just one slide, back. Sorry, there you go. Yeah, so... With corporate occupational medicine, I think it's it's much more frequently found um, in a lot of overseas situations, particularly in big uh, corporate entities working in um, countries where basic medical services aren't perhaps as accessible or comprehensive. Uh, and in a, a lot of that situations, medical practitioners and healthcare practitioners find themselves employed directly by the organisation. And that certainly has some benefits in a, awareness and knowledge of the workplace and the work situation. Um, and you can, in that situation, you can often get yourself um, involved in advising on health and safety risk management issues, particularly where prevention um, is is involved and um, and public general public health. You can get involved in hazard identification and health risk assessment, policy and pre procedure development. Hopefully. Uh, as a company representative involvement in the legislative and regulatory compliance and process by governments who often frequently, if they're like Australia, don't have a lot of expertise within their own um, organisation. And now and what's an area that's becoming more and more um, important from the corporate point of view is corporate social responsibility and the perceived involvement of big organisations in the healthy management and, and provision of safe working places. Uh, the other corporate thing that you can often get involved with is control of sickness absence and getting involved with that early um, intervening early in managing the absence and preferably early return to work and early resumption of appropriate duties, um, which is something that often doesn't happen if that's left to someone else to do. Uh, we often see, and I still see people who've been off work for six months, in some cases even 12 months, because they could have gone back to work uh, with appropriate selected duties and in situations where they're no longer exposed to the hazard, um, but they're not. They don't get back to work. They haven't had any involvement with work and work hasn't made some sort of um, awareness of what they can provide to the worker or his medical practitioner. The other situation you get involved with, of course, even if you're um, involved in industrial medicine, is environmental health issues, as we'll talk a little bit about later. Often it's the same problems that people in the workplace experience, uh, but all that's happened is the hazard has drifted over the fence and it's now affecting other people that live in the 
environment surrounding the workplace. Um, and the other thing you can get involved with is advising on product or the mm -hmm. safety or the safety of services that are produced by the company that the person works for. Next one. Uh, hi, John. Just wanted to remind you we're at the 45 minute mark. <laughs> yep. Great. Thank we'll you. We'll try and speed through a bit. Okay. Next one. So with absence management, um, we've got to remember that there's also presenteeism and, and absenteeism is when the worker doesn't turn up for work because he's um, ill or can't do the job. But the other thing is we also get people who turn up for work who are not fit to do all their duties, or worse still, if they've got some sort of um, infectious disease, they may in pass that uh, problem to other people in the workplace. And that was particularly obvious in some situations with the re recent problems that people may have experienced with COVID exposure, is people who turn up for work um, who pass on an infectious condition to other people in the workplace, magnifying the problem. Um, the other thing with absenteeism medical practitioners are often involved in is justifying medical certification of capacity to work. And, and the situation is more developing to assessments of capacity rather than just blanketly saying that the person is unfit for work. Um, often they're unfit for particular tasks in the workplace. Um, so some knowledge of the task and how people do the task is very important in that situation. Um, the other thing that uh, health practitioners may be involved with is attributing the work whether it's a, an attributable cause to the met, to the worker's condition. If there is an attributable cause in the workplace, then in situations where it's available, usually there's some form of worker's compensation or uh, covering costs of lost employment, what have you. Um, and the other thing, of course, that you get involved with, with presenteeism, giving the employer or the workplace management some idea of how long temporary placements may be in, in required. So if you've got someone who's got a situation where their illness is going to be settled down quickly, the existing working population may be able to look after that. Um, the other thing is post absence review. So once the person has ready or is ready to come back to work, um, that review is usually there to ensure that the person is fit to return to work, that he's not going to have another injury or aggravate condition that kept him off from work. So is he totally unfit to return to work? And as I said, that may be because of some infectious disease and a continuing risk from exposure to that. Or the other thing is, uh, particularly workers who are in the food industry, uh, are they going to spread the infectious disease they've got onto customers or other people that they're looking after? Um, provisionally, the other thing might be worthwhile um, is. Can you go back quickly? If we, uh, next, yeah. The other thing is if the person's not totally unfit to return to work, they may be able to go back with some um, suitable duties required. So, the thing that you can get involved with there is rehabilitation requirements. 
do there need to be any adjustments made to the workplace? And that may be something as simple as providing a ramp for workers to get into their and access their work site if they're using crutches or in a wheelchair. Um, and the other thing to think about in that situation is, is there continuing medical treatment going on? Does the worker have to go back and see the doctor for more treatment, more surgical, or have they been provided with medication? And if they've been provided with medication, is that medication likely to impact on their continuing employment? If they're given drugs for maybe painkillers or what have you, are they going to, is that going to cause drowsiness? Is there going to be problems with the patient's cognitive uh, capacity? Uh, can they think properly, if you like? Can they make important decisions if they're under the influence of uh, a painkiller or a, an antidepressant or a sedative type? medication. Next one. The other thing that often uh, medical practitioners get involved with if they're involved with corporate medicine is education and counselling. Um, and that may be particular uh, advice about hazards in the workplace and education and educating workers on how to look out for adverse effects associated with those hazards. Someone's working in a hot environment. It's nice if the workers can identify people who are having cognitive or physical impairment because of dehydration or other issues or general health promotion, promoting a uh, healthy diet, exercise, trying to reduce uh, non-work related hazards, particularly things like cigarette smoking. And that's very important in a situation where there are particular hazards in the in the working atmosphere or working environment. We all know the pathophysiology of the effects of cigarette smoking. It can affect the cilia in the trachea, and that's one of the body's defence mechanisms against inhaled particulates. If that's not working, then it magnifies the exposure and the effects of exposure to respiratory hazards. Next. We've got another pyramid here. So health promotion and counselling for those involved just to remember that the smallest impact is on counselling and education in the workplace. Then clinical intervention and counselling at the time of clinical intervention is a bit better. Long lasting protective interventions, teach things like giving up cigarette smoke. As long as the patient gives up cigarette smoking, then he's improving and reducing the likelihood of work-related lung disease from exposure to hazardous particles. Um, make the patient's defaults, if you like, um, safer. Things like of water supply, um, I, adding iodine to uh, the diet in areas where thyroid disease may be a problem. Um, reducing uh, tobacco smoking in the workplace and reducing exposure to accidental exposure to other workers there. And the other one, of course, is socioeconomic impact. So looking after and, and looking at poverty, education, housing, um, equality within the workplace. Literacy, those sort of things have the largest impact. Unfortunately, a lot of that depends on government situations, but again, some of the big multinationals often look at some form of education and socioeconomic equality within their workplace. Next. Okay. 
as we said, with our with our hierarchy of control measures, uh, stopping the exposure. And one way of that um, is immunisation. So immunising people against infectious diseases, like uh, maybe a lot of you were involved with COVID, um, particularly healthcare workers, the nature of their, their uh, work is particularly hazardous, the same as people working in laboratories or research with infectious agents travel overseas as part of the person's job. They may be going to areas where other sorts of communicable disease are present, or the other situation is agricultural workers, um, particularly things like exposure to zoonotic medical conditions that may be carried around and spread by animals that they come in contact with. Um, and all that, if we're looking at that, is looking at health maintenance and productivity of the workforce, and immunisation is a good, a good example of that. Next one. Disaster planning, things that we're looking at, uh, chemical spills, nuclear accidents, rail accidents, road accidents, terrorism and fire, all those areas um, you can get involved with with workers. Um, interestingly enough, the, the, the picture in the bottom right-hand side is Chernobyl, and that's an ongoing issue from a, a, a disaster occurring in a workplace. Uh, next one. Okay, environmental issues again, when the hazards are escaping from the workplace, um, the impact of emissions from the site or accidental spills and emissions and those fish and the fishermen on the right um, is the situation that occurred in Minimata where there was considerable public ill health and consequences from escape of mercury uh, from a pro from an industrial plant in Japan, uh, with with effects not just on the local workers but also the general population. Next, again, we were talking about consumer issues, particularly in the food in the in the food uh, with food handlers and in in the hospitality injury industry um, and also product safety. If you look at the one on the right and look very carefully, you can see these are dish towels that were circulated a while ago, used in the kitchen, very handy to have with you, particularly if something on the stove catches fire. So what the company did, they added asbestos to the towels. Um, of course, we all know now that that wasn't a very smart thing to do, uh, but things like asbestos can creep in around the place and, uh, and get involved in even the home situation as well as uh, other exposure in the workplace. Next. Okay, so the, another area that you can get involved with is auditing in quality assurance, something that's not done particularly well in Australia or in a lot of Australian organisations, but hopefully overseas where medical practitioners have a stronger voice. Um, compliance with internal and external quality standards, and there's a lot of international standards being publicised and promoted now. Uh, review of the structure and process and monitoring um, health management and occupational health and safety uh, programs and benchmarking. So uh, comparing yourself with a like organisation um, as a means of seeing how you're going and whether you're improving the situation or whether you're up with other standards. Um, next one. Factors contributing to disease, next one. Okay, now we have, go back the old model, 
around the 1980s and prior to the 1980s was what we call the biosocial model of disease. There was an accident or exposure, people had an injury or illness, and that led to an incapacity to, to work. The other thing that associate, was associated with that incapacity to work may be non-work-related pathology of a physical or biological situation. Uh, of course, once the incapacity starts, then there are other personal and environmental factors such as age and education and psychological background that may affect capacity to return to work particularly. Next one. Un unfortunately, that biome, oh, back one, I think we've skipped one. The biomedical model was taught up to the 1980s. Um, Nope, oh, go go on. That was right. And, and you can skip that one too. Um, that's about people's perception there. Health factors affecting safe and efficient work performance. What I was going to get to before we go to that is the new model of health is a biopsychosocial model. Um, and that's being adopted more and more, at least in Australian medical um, schools, uh, where you're looking not at just at the biological and health-related causes of conditions, but you're looking at things like social and psychological impacts that also have an effect on how the person reacts to his illness or injury. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the people who only have basic medical training, um, particularly those of my vintage who were getting on and went to medical school prior to the 1980s, um, got taught the biomedical model. Um, now, hopefully, or in Australia, at least in the medical schools that I've been involved with, um, the biopsychosocial model of illness is starting to get taught. Uh, it's still not widely taught in Australian undergraduate medical um, situations, but there are more and more medical schools that are teaching that model. Uh, and that's really looking at the injured worker themselves and how they're psychologically managing the situation and what their social support um, is like and, and what they've got that can help them through those those times. So getting getting involved with psychological support of the worker is just as important as sort of um, prescribing medication or undergoing and performing some sort of surgical procedure. Next. Okay, so the other thing that um, occupational physicians are are asked, often asked to do is medical assessment, and we touched on that briefly, but we've got, if you like, pre-employment or pre-placement assessment. In other words, is this person fit to do a job? Um, and I say pre-employment or pre um, and I think we may have a few um, legal people around the place. Um, and often the pre-employment medical is performed in some way to protect the employer about employing someone who may be a liability. Um, the problem is if you fail someone in a pre-employment check, um, are you discriminating against that person? Um, is he really unfit for work? Um, so sometimes, and, and that can be a big problem if unfair, if someone is, uh, is not given a job that they've been promised uh, because they failed their, their medical 
Uh, the next problem that may arise from that is um, litigation for unfair dismissal. Um, the problem is the person hasn't been employed, so there's no duty of care on the employer to undertake a pre-employment medical because he doesn't have a duty of care to that worker until that worker is employed. So in those situations, if there are hazardous um, tasks involved that the worker is going to be ex possibly exposed to, then it's often better to refer to pre-placement medicals. In other words, the worker is employed and then assessed to see whether he can be placed in a particular job. Um, so that's a problem that we will discuss in a couple of half minutes time. The other thing about medical assessment, pre-employment is, um, and it's useful because you can establish a baseline. What's the person's hearing like before they're employed and put in a noisy occupation? Do they have pre-existing lung disease? Is that going to be a problem if they've got respiratory hazards that they're going to be exposed to? So you can use your pre-placement assessment as well, if you like, to identify potential problems. And if a problem if there are potential problems or foreseeable problems that that work is going to be exposed to, then we can do something about monitoring that. Um, if someone already has a pre-existing disability um, is there, or pre-existing impairment rather, uh, is their disability going to be a problem? Is there reasonable workplace accommodation that can be made, modifying the work situation, adjusting the tasks that the worker has to do, or restricting certain situations that they may be involved with that may increase their risk of problem? So reasonable workplace accommodation may be something you're asked for assessment. Um, as I said, the applicability of legal requirements. In some situations, particularly with high-risk workers or risk workers undertaking high-risk jobs, there's often a regulatory requirement for those people to under, undergo pre-employment uh, assessment. And in that situation, you've usually got uh, the backup of the regulator if there's some dispute over whether people are fit or unfit to do a particular task. Um, and the other assessment of fitness for work, maybe after the person's employed, is um, do they have any current situations that need to be monitored? And what's their long-term prognosis like? Is it a situation that may get worse and deteriorate over time? And in that situation, then, some form of ongoing assessment, medical assessment may be required. Next one. Okay, the other thing about fitness for work and the traditional fitness for work that I see provided by lots of GPs and requested by lots of employees, is it cost effective? Is it discriminatory? Uh, my uh, professor in the UAE did a survey of several thousand pre-employment medicals undertaken by the National Health Service in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, and they looked at three or four thousand sort of uh, employment medicals. And, and the people that were considered unfit for work, I think, was less than 100. So they, the, comp, the employer spent lots and lots of money on doing medical assessments, which really didn't help them all that much. And the other thing that we talked about, is it going to be discriminatory? Is someone going to lose a job because they've got an impairment that someone thinks they can't um, work with? 
Um, and the guy that's shown here is an ex Air Force employee that lost both of his uh, lower limbs in a in an aircraft crash. It wasn't had nothing to do with his military uh, situation. It was recreational flying. He had a was involved in a crash, lost both his legs below the knee, and he now is working for the flying doctor in Tasmania and flying quite capably. Before his job with the flying doctor, when he was still in the Air Force, he used to pilot the Prime Minister of Australia around in his personal plane. Um, so there's someone with what pe mo most people would consider uh, an impairment that would prevent him from undertaking particular jobs, but it certainly didn't uh, increase the risk of injury when he was flying an aircraft. Next one. Someone else who was given two years to live in 1963. And as a consequence of that, he was immobile, had significant uh, discussion, uh, problems with, with communication, but he managed to revolutionise physics for the next 50 years or more. Um, a good illustration of impairment and disability and why if we're uh, giving people large sums of money, we should be looking at uh, spending that money perhaps on people with significant disability, not impairment. Uh, if we're going to treat impairment, we should treat impairment uh, with uh, the money and use the money that impaired people get as a lump sum payment to fund proper rehabilitation and return to work programs. Next one. And the last one, of course, is the importance of getting an occupational history and a walkthrough. Next one. So what we need to do and what a lot of doctors doing occupational medicine don't get the opportunity to do is go out and assess the workplace, have a look at it. Walking around and doing a walk around the workplace, you can often recognise several hazards that are there. That helps you evaluate patients who come in with medical problems. Um, recognising the hazards, but also doing an evaluation of the risks. As we said before, is there exposure? If there's exposure, what's the concentration or how significant is the hazard? And what's the probability of the risks? Is there, if there's no exposure, there's no risk, even though there may be a significant hazard that people involved with. And the other thing, of course, is recommendations for control measures and monitoring and review. This guy uh, on the right there was uh, welding and his uh, protection uh, from welding flash was a piece of paper stuck behind some, a pair of sunglasses. So not only did he not really protect himself terribly well from welder's flash, but he ran the risk of having a fire in his face. Um, next one. Okay, so we mentioned a little bit about post-employment or periodic medical assessment. Um, and that's when your health surveillance and health assessment is targeted. So we know the hazardous exposures. Um, we know the chronic and medical conditions that can arise from exposure to that. So we can assess how those at-risk people, whether they're starting to show signs or we can use biological monitoring to test exposure. So urine, urine testing to see whether people have metabolites of hazards that they've been exposed to in the workplace in their urine. So that is a situation where you know what you're looking for. Pre-employment medicals 
you often don't know what you're looking for. You're just looking in a person's health and you don't know the situation that they're moving into. It's difficult to produce any useful information. Whereas this, if you know what you're looking for, you're testing for what you're looking for, you can inform the workplace that, yes, this person has been exposed, so they need to do something about it or no, there's no evidence of exposure. And that may indicate that the hazard has been successfully managed in the workplace. Um, and again, as we said, there are some situations with safety critical work where there's a requirement for people to do post-employment medical, usually periodic, done every one year, every five years. That depends a little bit on what the situation is and what the person does, but people like pilots, train drivers, firefighters, or people transmitting dangerous goods are particular ones that most of us get involved in from time to time. Next one. Uh, John, we've got some interesting questions coming through. Um, uh, yeah. Would you like to Well, go maybe now, we'll or? call it quits in the, envir in the environmental and public health area. <laughs> okay, sure. No problems. So we have, we have, that may be something that we can do later on. No worries. So uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll probably go through the questions. There's some interesting comments that have come across. Uh, thanks for that descriptive, you know, detailed presentation and the dedication that come across. Uh, I've got a question here from Andreas. Uh, Breitbart, uh, uh, thank you for an informative presentation. Two questions if you have time. What do you feel are currently some of the shortcomings of OEM practice in the Australian context? Um, and what do you foresee the future will be in developed countries for occupational environmental medicine, particularly for environmental medicine? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the first one was in Australia and in the Australian context. Um, un unfortunately, uh, my practice, like probably a lot of other occupation, special occupational physicians practice, is seeing people who've already got problems. Um, I think in Australia, we need to focus more on prevention and companies need to focus more and more on preventive measures rather than waiting for a problem to occur and doing that. Too much money is wasted on unproductive and ineffective, ineffective um, fitness for work assessments, where it doesn't have a lot of good uh, Sorry, we lost you there, John. Um... Uh, so while John comes back, uh, I'll just go through the next question as well. Um, uh, we've actually probably lost John over there, but I might just carry on until John comes back. Um, uh, I, th I think the future of environmental medicine is, uh, is what we're really looking forward to. Uh, occupational medicine has been well developed in developed countries in Australia. Uh, it's environmental medicine where we can see a lot of uh, deliberation um, and a lot of uh, progress happening. I think we probably lost John there, but until he comes back, uh, I'll probably help out with the questions over here and read out a few comments uh, that we have received. Um, um, yes, the presentation will be shared afterwards. Um, uh, and their questions, how do I learn more about occupational medicine? educational opportunities in Australia. Um, and there's a question here from uh, Malaysia as well. I'm Dr. Shaval from Malaysia. Can I know where can I further study more on clinical occupational medicine with regular exposure, specific ward round and clinics for occupational disease cases, multidisciplinary team approach, tertiary referral center. Is there any such facility available in any country? Uh, thanks for your question, Dr. Shaval. So in terms of uh, uh, the scope and opportunity in Australia, I think there's uh, uh, there's plenty of an opportunity for work uh, when it comes to occupational medicine. Uh, you do need to go through your 
relevant uh, accreditations uh, while you come over to Australia, but we do offer uh, a facility and that's something John was going to touch base later down the track. Uh, and I think John is uh, coming back on. Um, he should be back here shortly, but uh -huh. hi, John. And we lost you there briefly. Uh, and we, we would be really uh, willing to offer you any such opportunity. Uh, I'm based in Sydney uh, and uh, John is based in Mackay, but with our uh, educational endeavors, we would like to offer uh, opportunity for further training for overseas doctors. Um, however, that's something we can have a chat about uh, in the future. Um, mind you, there's a huge difference between practice in Southeast Asia, Dr. Shaval. So you're based in Malaysia and in Australia. Um, I've been to Malaysia several times, but it would be very interesting for you to see and visit us and see how uh, the scope of practice is diversified uh, within private and public sectors uh, in occupational environmental medicine. Uh, Shifan's uh, comment, nice and detailed presentation. When will you hold more sessions like this? Yes, we are really looking forward to holding more sessions in the future. Um, and um, uh, we will make this as a regular occurrence as well. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Shanaira, I think we got you back. Um, I was just going through the questions that were coming through here and helping out. Uh, we had some questions from Malaysia. Uh, and questions about more future opportunities for occupational environmental medicine in Australia and the scope of practice. Uh, so, uh, John, are you there now? Yeah. yeah can you great. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, John. So you're nice and clear. I'll address the next question to you now. Uh, so a question has come across from Dr. Ali Hussain. Very nice presentation, Professor. Uh, currently based in Abu Dhabi and work as an occupational physician in oil and gas industry. So. Thanks, uh, Dr. Hussain. Thanks for your compliment. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hussain Mavanga, a great presentation. I'm in Tanzania. I have noted that some employers are more interested in well-being rather than occupational health itself. What is your experience on this? Thank you. Thanks for that. So that's to you, John. Thanks. Um, so I think John's probably... Uh, struggling with internet issues, but nevertheless, uh, I'll, I'll carry on with those questions there. So Dr. Hussain, thanks for your question. Uh, nice of you to join us from Africa. Um, uh, yes, uh, I agree with you. There's a preventative approach with well-being rather than occupational health itself, but a part of occupational health is about well-being, uh, health and well-being and promotion of it. Uh, so it is public health in the workplace, as we like to call it. Um, and our experience is that when there's a proactive preventative approach by the employer, uh, it actually goes a long way and it does uh, speak volumes. Um, so employers who are more focused on well-being do tend to assist with intervention when it comes to injury management down the track with health surveillance and toxicology. But nevertheless, I think your question is more peculiar with your background. Um, so... Um, I might not have answered your question, but um, our understanding in Australia is that health and well-being, uh, preventative medicine, public health goes hand in hand with workplaces. Uh, I might get Dr. Schneider to answer that question when he's back. Um, I'll go through the next comment here. Uh, great job, Dr. John and team. Your content was relevant. Your format was uh, visually appealing and easy to understand. Thanks for your comment, Patricia. Um, Dr. Vishwaraj, uh, excellent webinar. Thank you, Dr. John and Fahan. Regards, uh, Dr. Vishwaraj Mahal Shekhar from India. Thanks for your comment. Uh, uh, Muazzam Zaidi, uh, nice to see you. Uh, thanks, uh, Muaz Al Hadi, excellent presentation. Many thanks. Excellent presentation. Many thanks, Muaz Al Hadi. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I'll probably carry on because uh, our presentation is still ongoing. I'll, I'll carry on to the next phase uh, before we finish off tonight. Uh, and my apologies that uh, Dr. Schneider was unable to join. Uh, we'll probably carry on this presentation uh, in our next phase. Uh, there's a lot of content that he wanted to share. 
um, and we'll come back to the questions when he's back on track. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about today was discuss about our, um, our concept uh, and our initiative in offering you education uh, through our portal, Med Education Online. We really like to promote occupational medicine education across the world globally. Uh, Australia has been a pioneer. We do have strong curriculum um, and uh, we have a strong training program. Uh, it's an Australasian faculty, Australasian meaning it comprises of Australia and New Zealand, two countries combined. We offer um, uh, a, a very um, a detailed uh, staged uh, educational uh, program for training registrars. Uh, however, uh, noting the de developments in our neighboring countries, uh, me and Professor Schneider would like to offer you further insight. Um, and I would like you to visit our website, mededucationonline.com.au, which will provide you significant opportunities uh, in the future for further webinars, sessions as well. Um, and uh, if you have a look at my website as well, our website, uh, you would see that uh, there's an option to subscribe uh, and also details to say that we are launching soon uh, with further content availability for online education. And this will provide you an opportunity to learn online um, relatively easily uh, in the comfort of your own space, but it will also provide you opportunity to connect with myself and Professor Shanaida uh, in the future. Um, and also have opportunities to possibly visit us uh, and observe our practices. Um, and uh, the, the mission that we have uh, with our uh, endeavor is to promote occupation environmental medicine, occupation health and safety globally. So the audience over here is not only medical practitioners, but health professionals alike, which includes nurses, or any other allied health professionals, EPs, physio, occupational therapists, even health and safety managers uh, in the workplace. Um, so uh, the audience is relatively open, uh, but our dedication and focus is to medical prof uh, professionals overseas. And Professor Schneider has a fair bit of uh, um, uh, collegial support overseas. And I think with his time spent in the Middle East, some of you have known him and seen him present in the past as well. Um, we would like to share that me and uh, uh, John Schneider would be presenting on a practical workshop at the Australian New Zealand Society of Occupational Medicine uh, and SOM in Canberra this year. Uh, you are invited to attend. It's an international organization. Um, it's an annual uh, scientific meeting uh, being held in, in Canberra. On the 24th of October, myself and John will hold a workshop from 2 p.m. onwards, uh, which will be a practical insight into the basics of occupational medicine and give you an opportunity to learn hands-on uh, and get more experience. Uh, some of you who might, who might not be aware, you could register on this uh, website on the link below, which I'll share later on as well. Um, and uh, you're more than welcome to come and join us. Um, the society does have a full on condensed program, which runs for several days with worksite visits and exposure to all developments in occupation environmental medicine across Australasia. So, uh, so I'm, I would be really glad to see uh, this be a regular occurrence and we catch up furthermore in the future with more events with uh, uh, other colleagues, in particular with uh, uh, John Schneider. And we look forward to seeing you face to face if there's an opportunity to come and join us in Canberra. Um, so, John, I hope we have you back again. Um, yes, we, we have uh, unsettled... Um atmospheric conditions here and a bit of fun oh. around the place so oh. okay. i think that's interfering with the transmission sure. there were a few questions that i uh, i would like you to answer um so we've had a question from um dr shaval from malaysia asking about opportunities in australia in clinical occupational medicine and to see the multidisciplinary approach um uh, and also anywhere else outside Malaysia where they could go to? Um, well, Malaysia, I know uh, the Irish faculty runs exams 
in KL um, on a fairly regular basis if they've got enough attendees. Um, so it may be worthwhile, and, and they also run um, examinations in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, so they've got three examination sites that people can go to get an internationally recognised qualification um, and, and peer assessment. Um, unfortunately, uh, in Australia, we tend to focus on uh, medical practitioners and registration of those practitioners within Australia. Um, so there's often a residency requirement and there's uh, a requirement for uh, training depending on what your background is. Um, so uh, that's something you think about, but the uh, Australian New Zealand uh, Faculty of Occupational Environmental Medicine website and the Irish uh, uh, website are worthwhile seeing. Um, and having a look at, and that will give you some indication of what goes on. Um, it, there is a, a benefit, I suppose, in having one of those qualifications um, because they are internationally recognised. So it probably would help people wishing to work in occupational medicine for uh, larger organisations and multinationals to have that sort of background and qualification. Um, but as I said, different organisations have different requirements. Most of them have an exam at the end of that. Um, and then there's a number of universities in Australia that offer health and safety training, not necessarily for medical practitioners, but it does give you a bit of a, an insight and background to health and safety management at work sites. Um, and that's a part of a requirement for the Australasian uh, um, qualification. Um, but that's, that's as much as I could give. Uh, there, there's opportunities for occupational medicine in Australia. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those um, occupational medicine uh, opportunities uh, are offered by uh, corporate medical providers who really don't have a lot of background in occupational medicine themselves and you end up doing pre-employment medicals um, and poorly management and in effect you've uh, health surveillance programs. Uh, so you've got to be a bit careful about where you work for and what the sort of work you're going to get. It's probably better talking to an Australian colleague and getting some information off them before uh, overseas people try to rush here. Uh, as I said, the, the situation in Australia is from the very good to the very poor in occupational medicine, um, but there's not a lot of opportunities in corporate medicine, unfortunately. Um, so we've, we, uh, so Warren has passed on his message as well and uh, appreciated. Uh, it's a great introduction. Uh, so thanks for uh, your comments, Warren. So uh, as you would not be aware, Warren Horrocks is the president of the Australasian Faculty of Occupation Environmental Medicine. He's the current acting president, and we appreciate uh, his time that he's been here with us today. Um, um, I've had a few questions burning coming through from Dr. Ali Hussain in Abu Dhabi, who works in oil and gas. Um, he's uh, inquired um, whether there are any opportunities in Australia after LFOM, Irish exams. Uh, and uh, an earlier question he had was, uh, yep, yeah, uh, so earlier he introduced himself and that's his question, John, thanks. Yeah, well, well, the LFOM is certainly useful um, at getting a position, but it's not a specialist, uh, it's not a, a recognised specialist qualification as far as the uh, Australian um, 
health system is concerned, um, it will probably serve you well as background if you're going to do uh, get an Australian qualification. But it certainly won't uh, allow you practice as a specialist, although there may well uh, be in positions that that uh, are available to you that wouldn't be available for someone with no background at all. Great. Uh, we had a question from uh, uh, Dr. Hussain uh, from Tanzania. Uh, and um, uh, the question was, uh, uh, which I tried to answer earlier, um, uh, a great presentation. I'm in Tanzania. I've noted that some employers are more interested in well-being rather than occupational health itself. What is your experience on this? What were they interested in? Uh, so the question is employers are more interested in well-being rather than occupational health itself. Um, yeah, um, well, occupational health is certainly part of well-being. Uh, and, and the two are related. And that's why we tried to uh, marry occupational and environmental health together. Um, I mean, if, pa if patients are well and looked after well, then their productivity is going to be, uh, to be a lot better. Um, the thing about employers is employers probably have more of an impact and are likely to have more of an impact on work-related hazards um, and exposure to that and, and risk management or health risk management from that, that perspective. Um, certainly the health risk assessments that you can get involved in doing may help uh, identify problems within the process at the workplace. Um, as I said, you know, Public general public health and uh, and general health and well being are certainly worthwhile, but uh, often you know a lot of employers don't don't look at that and and allow things. Uh, certainly in Australia, the the worker themselves to manage their health care. Yep. Uh, so, Dr. Hussain, uh, thanks for your questions. I can allow you to have a chat if you want to. Uh, I've just turned you, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask if that answered your question. Uh, happy for you to join in uh, in this case. Hello, thanks. Uh, thank you for your presentation, John and Farhan. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm from Tanzania. So, in Tanzania, you know, we, the the regulation is not as strict. Uh, so uh, when you're approaching an employer, if you want to uh, kind of work on a program, like for example, looking at the musculoskeletal disorders, or you want, you want to do a risk assessment, or you want to do an exposure assessment, then they, uh, because they're trying to save uh, the cost, so they, 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 they probably tell you that, you know, they, the employee would be more interested if you, you come with a program looking at the prevention of uh, non-communicable diseases rather than the, the typical um, occupational hazards. Okay, so that's kind of been experienced here in Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for, your, for, your, for your replies. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hussain. Um, of course, different, different situations in different countries uh, vary. Um, and often in Australia, certainly where there is um, very great regulation on workers' compensation for work-related injuries and illnesses, um, that can be a, a fairly significant financial burden on the employer if, if people are having injuries. Um, but where, where labour is cheap and plentiful, um, I'm afraid there's there's often not much um, incentive to to prevent things. The only thing that you can you can point out is, I mean, if there are major in, injuries uh, happening in the workplace, 
then that interferes in itself with productivity. I mean, if, if there's serious industries in, in mining in Australia, um, that can shut down the whole mine for several days or at least for a lot uh, to a situation um, and, and the first aid is implemented. So uh, reduction in productivity may be something that may be worthwhile considering pointing out to employers. Um, that and absenteeism and finding people, uh, the more skilled the workforce is, usually the harder it is to find replacements. Um, and even if you do get replacements, then they really, unless they've worked in that environment before, they don't have the awareness of regular employees. And if they don't have the awareness of regular employees, they're at increased risk of having accidents and injuries. So you can argue around and around in circles, but the better trained and the healthier the workforce is, the better the productivity and the less productivity is going to be affected by injury and illness at work. Um, John, we've got Dr. Ali Hussain, I think, uh, wanted to speak up as well. Uh, he's from Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Hussain, Ali Hussain. Yes, Ali. Yes, Dr. Farhan uh, and Dr. Professor, uh, thank you for your valuable time. And uh, it was a very good presentation. Uh, learned a lot of insight about the uh, practice of occupational medicine in Australia. Uh, I have been actually working in this oil and gas industry, and I also happened to work for a little time with uh, the late Professor Tarshi, and uh, he was uh, the executive for occupational medicine in, in that talk, and uh, have learned a lot of uh, insights to occupational medicine, which got me interested to take this exam of licentiate, which I took recently, and I'm looking forward to take the membership. And definitely want to enhance my scope of practice moving uh, to Western countries because uh, that will give me more, uh, you know, uh, education about the real uh, occupational medicine. And that's the reason I asked this question uh, about the scope of practice in Australia, uh, which is very really informative and uh, uh, which really uh, the professor has answered well that definitely. Uh, licentiate is just the beginning. It's not uh, a specialization where I need to do my membership. So is there any scope after membership in Australia or I still need to uh, do some training in Australia? Uh, you would still probably need some training in Australia. Um, Australia doesn't have licentiates and doesn't have membership. They only have fellowship. Um and, and that's because of the way our health system works, um, is you're either uh, a specialist or a non-specialist or trainee. Um, and the system of specialist training is developed particularly for the Australian sort of uh, health system. Um, New Zealand is a little bit different. Um, I, I also worked with Professor Ta Ching when I was uh, residing in our own. Um, and uh, I don't know whether you know uh, uh, Dr. Moazam Zadi, but he moved to New Zealand. And uh, entry to New Zealand is, and their medical system is a little... Um, a little more easily to uh, to join than the Australian system, um, and and they do uh, recognise Irish qualifications a little more. Um, it depends how it does depend in Australia how much experience you've got. Um, you may be able to work as a specialist under supervision of another. Um, of another specialist um, until you've uh, either passed another exam or accumulated a certain uh, uh, period 
of experience. Thank you, Professor. Thanks a lot for your uh, answer. It was very really valuable, and I hope to work on it in future. Uh, thanks for that. So I'll I'll just quickly go through because we got a fair few questions coming in. Doctor um, Abdul Aziz, uh, would you like to speak up? Uh, I've seen your question come in as well, uh, Doctor Muhammad Abdul Sattar Abdul Aziz. Uh, the question that uh, came through from um, Dr. Abdulaziz was, uh, I'll probably read it out. Do we have references or standards to test done in periodic annual health assessments, uh, welding fume exposed workers? Uh, he's asking for biological tests and I think he's asking for guidelines as well. Um, uh, John, would you like to guide to safe work or anything similar? Yeah, um, Australia's had a, in the last 10 years, I suppose, a review of their um, regulations and requirements. Um, unfortunately, Australia is, is composed of six different states and up until uh, not very long ago, uh, each state had different requirements. Um, Everything has been sort of uh, tended to be reviewed and is still in the process of, of developing national standards. Um, but Safe Work Australia may be an area to, uh, to have a look at if you can get online and do it. But other, otherwise, um, you know, there, there are a lot of online resources now for health standards and and for um uh, and the us has has lots of stuff too and i think now that the uh the uh uk and the uh european union are developing standards as well too so um there are standards around they may vary from place to place. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure, where, where are you practicing, Mohammed? I know that the UAE were developing um, their own standards and requirements some time ago. And I assume that they've... Uh, that uh, they've yes, Dr. Uh, Mohammed, please. The yes, uh, thanks, Doctor. I'm, I'm practicing in Egypt, I'm Egyptian. And I'm a occupational health specialist. And uh, sometimes uh, I, I've been working around in mining and uh, uh, building materials, petrochemicals and oil and gas. So uh, whenever I go to a new business, I try to search for the uh, annual health assessment uh, uh, standardized tests. So uh, I cannot find it uh, uh, in one place with the same shape. So usually I use the international regulation for it, yes. Yeah, I think if you if you don't have local requirements and regulations, at least if you uh, you perform um, assessments uh, that comply with European Union standards, or or uh, then that's probably better than nothing, um, unless you're uh, working and and doing work for a large multinational, then uh, um, the really big multinationals usually have their own health and safety procedures and protocols, um, and, and they're often based on where the head office of the company is, whether it's in uh, Europe or it's in the United States. Great. Uh, so I think that answered that question. Uh, we had another question from Malaysia. Occupation noise induced hearing loss is number one disease. Is occupation noise still a problem in your country? Uh, so I'll pass that on to John, but the answer is yes. It certainly is. Uh, <laughs> and it's a big problem in the mining industry where I work. Um, but because it doesn't kill people, it doesn't get a lot of uh, 
lot of publicity um, and it's largely being ignored. Uh, like a lot of things, uh, the if it if it the issue um, is dealt with by the media and gets on television, uh, the politicians do something about it. But if it doesn't, um, you know, they're quite happy to live in blissful ignorance. Right. So I, I think we've uh, come to an end uh, uh, on the questions um, today. We've had some great comments come through. I think one comment that stood out is how to get further opportunities, training and experience in Australia. Um, and also if this would be repeated again in the future. Uh, so, John, while we lost you in the middle, I did discuss with the audience about our plans on uh, the website development for online modular delivery and also our workshop in Canberra on 24th of October. Um, uh, and we are hopeful, it's a hybrid event, and we're hopeful to see more people there. Um, and um, um, I think that's it from me now, John. Uh, was there anything else you would like to add on? No. Um, apart from the, the bit of technical glitch and the uh, the time it took to get through that presentation, uh, yeah. uh, it may be worthwhile doing another shorter one um, and talking about uh, international recognition and qualifications um, and and catch up with what we didn't get around to uh, with the public health. Really appreciate your time, everybody. It's, uh, I, I know that we are getting around to two hours. I really appreciate your patience in sticking around uh, and spending time with us. And we hope to see you again in the future. As mentioned earlier, uh, please visit our website, Med Education Online, and be tuned to see further developments come in. Uh, we will send you a copy of this uh, presentation today. Uh, and if you could make it to Canberra on the 24th of October, we would love to see you there face to face. Uh, if not, you could attend it by hybrid and as an online attendance as well uh, for a hands-on workshop. Um, I, I appreciate the time. And wherever you are in the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, it's definitely a good night for us. Uh, thanks, John, for your time today. I really appreciate it. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and if anyone that I've met in my past life is still there, have a good April and <laughs> good luck in the years to come. Great. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Peace.